guy knows Vietnam. He has covered it from one end to the other. And I'm looking forward to this story uh, that he's going to be telling us about. Uh, he took a friend of his back who had been in a battle. And Larry, why don't you come on up? I do have a very personal story to tell you uh, about the three people in that picture, but really it's not about me. It's about the guy on the right, one of my closest friends in the world, a Marine. I'll talk to you about him in a second. Uh, Michael Holmes went down in Quezon on Hill 861, and that's the story I'm going to tell. And the middle guy is a man by the name of Pham Sunan, the most heralded spy of the Vietnam era. And the focus, I know many of you bought my book, Perfect Spy, um, and uh, that's the guy right there. And uh, during the war, of course, he was the most heralded. No one knew he was a spy after the war. Uh, pr he was promoted by the North Vietnamese to the rank of general. Uh, uh, he came out from under his cover, which I'll talk to you about. But then, in a, in, in a really interesting turn of events, uh, became the leader of reconciliation between our two countries. And this is really a story about how Michael reconciled extraordinary devils in his own life, because he hated Vietnam. He hated what Vietnam did to him. Uh, he hated the fact that uh, he has a 100% disability and he can barely stand up sometimes. You know, he didn't look like that when he was in Khe Sanh, uh, but uh, uh, I love him, and he's my, my brother, and I want to tell you how the events, that, it's a very personal story, much different than the Zumwalt story I talked to you about, and how these two men helped each other. But most important, how Tham Sunan helped, uh, helped Michael. So why don't we uh, go to the next slide. Right. So and th th this is the two guys in front of my, this is the end of the story. Let's go to the next slide. You want this one to walk around? Uh, yeah, that would be great. Might be easier. Let's see. Oh, no, it won't because he's... I just saw my last one was on YouTube. So let's go through a couple here. So obviously, I don't have to tell you, you warriors, about the horrors of what happened in Vietnam and all the people you lost and those of you who came back with part of the war still with you even to today. Let's go to the next slide. The Vietnamese, it's a Vietnamese cemetery. They suffered a lot too, an extraordinary, extraordinary amount. So in the, in the, in the, year, about, in the year 2000, I met Pham Sun An for the first time. And uh, I described in the book the, that encounter. We don't have a lot of time to go into it. But after two years, uh, I convinced him to allow me to write his story. He had turned down the rights to his story by some very famous authors. Uh, and the reason he selected me was because he felt that he had not known me during the war and because he had read previous books of mine, particularly one entitled No Peace, No Honor, Nixon, Kissinger, and Betrayal in Vietnam, which is really a study about how the war ended and how for the first time in history the United States let down an ally, the South Vietnamese, um, many of whom amongst my closest friends in the world, and we let them basically run out of bullets. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It's a very complicated story. But, but in 1975, we basically, we basically said to people we had given our word to, we had, you know, and they let us bring 550,000 American troops, defoliate jungles, bomb the country. We said, you're on your own now. Okay, and we left. Because the American people were fickle of war, were fickle of war um, and, uh, and there was no way the Congress was going to approve a continuing resolution under President Ford. And basically, for the South Vietnamese and for Vietnam, it became the next eight to 10 years a hell, a living hell, in which the South Vietnamese, anyone who was associated with us, were sent off to, to re-education camps, which were really basically prison, uh, prisons where they were tortured and where they were punished. And when they, even when they were released, they had no chance of economic livelihood. Or their cemeteries, the Arvin cemeteries, were destroyed and desecrated. And basically, to the victors, not only went the spoils, but to the victors came the right to punish, in their own mind, those South Vietnamese who had sided with the United, United States. So at the end of our own Civil War, when Abraham Lincoln, in his Gettysburg, in, in his most famous address, you know, said, it's time for brother and brother to heal the, nation, the nation's wounds and to help each other step up and to become one nation, the exact opposite happened in, in Vietnam, where retribution and punishment to the South and while in the and, and which the, the North Vietnamese became well now it was called Vietnam became a unified country with two allies in the world Cuba and the Soviet Union, um, primarily because of the economic boycott that the United States and other countries had had implemented in between 1975 and 1984. So let's go on. 
So Thompson and I began to let me write a story. We can go run through these. I would make up, and eventually it resulted in this book, Perfect Spy, and now the Vietnamese edition, Perfect Spy. And then I was just there, I came back just four days ago because a new Vietnamese edition um, has been launched and you could just do a Google search and you could see on YouTube, you can see some of the things that happened in Vietnam this trip, which was extraordinarily, extraordinary for me with respect to the book. And we just sold now uh, the movie rights to the book. So I'm very excited about the fact that there will be a movie based upon Pham Su Nan's life. Now, who was Pham Su Nan? Because and how is he related to Michael? Pham Su Nan during the war was worked for Time Magazine. Many of you may know his story, but he worked for Time Magazine. He was the most skilled, political, and uh, op he, was, he was very sensitive politically. He had extraordinary friends. He had a great sense of humor. He spoke English perfectly, which he had learned here in the United States. Uh, he had uh, in his press passes access to all military bases. His closest friends were the American CIA. His trip to the United States had been sponsored by Edward Lansdale, who invented, created the CIA in Vietnam, first American presence uh, there. And uh, he was also friends with the highest ranking Vietnamese, both in the intelligence agencies and in uh, the military. He was trusted by everybody. In, in human, we would call this in intelligence, this is human intelligence. Basically, uh, he was able to infiltrate the enemy camp by basically creating a cover that was impregnable. No one had any idea who he was and what he was doing during this time. His cover was, was, was as a journalist. Let's go next. Let's go to the next one. He was really 863, Operation 86. That was the real Pham Sunan after the war, promoted to the rank of general, and became the most heralded of all the Vietnamese spies. Also, he was one of the few that really lived, because so many of them had been caught by our own intelligence or the Vietnamese Central Intelligence. Let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to come back to that story in a second. Now enters Michael. This is a, the Marines will recognize this right away and others will too. This is at Khe San, although it's a lot greener, as Michael said, than it was when he was there. Uh, and uh, Michael uh, is probably one of the two or three of my closest friends in the world. And what happened was, uh, he refused to talk about Vietnam, he refused to uh, do anything about Vietnam, think about it, reflect on it, because he dreamed nightmares about it for some 20 or 25 years. And I started writing on this book. I started writing on this subject, one, two, three, four, five. And one day he comes over to me and he goes, I've been reading your books, man, and uh, I've got to ask you to do me a favor. I go, what? And he calls me little buddy. And he goes, uh, little buddy, I want you to take me back to Nam. He goes, I got to go. I got to go because what I'm reading in your books is a different, the war is over. He goes, but I got to deal with a lot of crap. I really got to do it. Now, a lot of you don't want to do it. I understand that. And a lot of people have gone back and done it. And everyone's experience is different. And I was not a warrior. Okay? So I didn't go through what you did. Okay? But I have the ex most extraordinary respect, respect and sensitivity for those who did. But when he asked me to take him back, it was an awesome burden for me. A burden not in, I didn't want to do it, but I was worried, you know. I was worried about what might happen when we got there, whether we might freak out or not, okay. And that has happened to many veterans who have gone back. Uh, how would we be able to deal with it psychologically? And what, what would I do? Um, and uh, how could I really help him? It took me about six months of preparation. He and I talked about it. Um, and Michael was uh, Company A, 1st uh, Battalion, 9th Marine, 3rd Marine Division at Quezon known as the Walking Dead. Some of you uh, might know this division. There we are on the way up. Let's go next, what, next slide. Next slide. Uh, ne that's Pham Sunan. Uh, uh, that's when I first met Pham Sunan. Let's keep going for a second because I want to get to the Michael story. Let's, next, next. So this is the book, No Peace, No Honor. An had read it. I'm going to bring Michael and An together in a second. I'm really going to tell you about Michael's journey. An had read that book, No Peace, No Honor. You, agreed to let me write a story. Aunt raised birds, raised dogs, all part of his cover during the war. But here's the key to understanding Aunt. Just stop there for a second. In 1955, right after the French had been defeated at Dien Bien Phu, and the Americans started showing up in Vietnam, before any of you were in Vietnam, but the American CIA is starting to show up, and Edward Lansdale arrives in Vietnam. And the Vietnamese, they were known as the Viet Minh at the time, 
before it became an American war, when all the Vietnamese wanted to do was the right to self-determination, the right to independence, okay, before they had defeated the Chinese, they had defeated the French, they had, their whole history was about the right to self-determination. If anyone in Washington had ever read a single goddamn book, excuse me, about Vietnam history, they would have known that. They would have known it. Okay? But the bureaucrats in Washington and the State Department, those who sent all you young guys off, okay, they didn't understand a single thing about Vietnam, but worst of all, they didn't care about the Vietnamese. They only really cared about one thing, losing Vietnam and the implication of losing Vietnam with respect to the Soviet Union, China, containment, dominoes, and all those things, right? They'd be in San Francisco, okay, if we didn't t stand in Vietnam. And how couldn't we defeat a nation that fought in pajamas, right? That was basically it. Well, 550,000 troops later, we learned an extraordinary story about the resiliency of what the Vietnamese believed in. You know, and I sometimes, and we can get into this discussion later, I hope no one says Vietnam was an undercommitment, like as we were going into the Persian Gulf War and Dan Quayle, that great warrior, said, this isn't gonna be another Vietnam. We're not gonna go in with one arm tied behind my back, I'll be behind our back. How can anyone say that 550,000 American troops, the linebacker one, linebacker coup two, defoliation, any one of you had been at Cameron Bay, that wasn't an undercommitment of resources. It was a total misunderstanding of how to apply those resources in a limited war environment, completely. It's one of the reasons why I'm constantly being asked to talk on counterinsurgency in Washington and elsewhere, because the greatest example of a failure to understand the nature of a war was in Vietnam. Okay? And every time I'm at that Vietnam Memorial, I'm reminded of that. I think every president should be made to go there. Just made to go there. Just think about the implications of not understanding, or maybe not being a warrior. Pretty soon, it's going to be impossible to have a, someone who had been a warrior president of the United States. But in 1955, the Viet Minh, these people who didn't know anything, knew the United States was coming. Knew they were coming. Just a matter of time, the Vietnam the bank was being created, the agents were there, and they had to find out who these Americans were. They looked around, they found this guy, Pham Sunan, young kid who had learned English from missionaries, and they decided they were going to send him to the United States in 1955 and 1956. They had to raise a couple of thousand dollars, they had to create an alias for him, they had to do all this stuff, okay? And they had to get a sponsor. So they got a sponsor, the American CIA, Edward Lansdale, because An went to him and he presented himself um, as an ardent anti-communist who wanted to come to the United States, learn the American system of the free press, get, get a college education. And An's mission was to go to America and learn about the American people, their psyche, and come back in about five or six years and advise the Vietnamese government because they knew they'd be at war with the Americans. So in 1957, An, with two suitcases, a couple of thousand bucks, and sponsorship by Edward Lansdale, the great crusader, arrives at Orange Coast College in, in Casa Mesa, California to begin two years of study. And he, he now let's run through these slides, if you will. He, and you can see, just run through this quickly. He, he loves, he, he becomes, he's the first Vietnamese in Orange County, today the largest Vietnamese population in the United States. He, he totally, totally immerses himself in the American way of life. He becomes friends with everyone. Uh, everyone loves him. He writes for the newspaper. He attends all these functions as he's circled up here, but let's run through this quickly. He writes this great article in the Sacramento Bee called Vietnamese Journalist Prepares to Go Back and Fight Communism. That's a picture with on with the governor of California, Edmund G. Brown, uh, and who identifies on, stop for a second, who identifies on as the leading journalist being trained in the United States to go back to Vietnam and combat international communism. Little did they know that this man's cover, and you talk about perpetrators in 9-11 and how they immerse themselves in our society, et cetera, that's the vulnerability sometimes of democracies, which is we're so susceptible to this kind of human intelligence being reached. On, on receives that gift from his Orange Coast uh, college friends. Let's go on here. Let's advance the slides, please, thank you. Gets a California driver's license, Tom Sunan, Orange Coast College buys this car, next, next one, and then drives across the United States, interns in the United Nations, works for the International Herald Tribune, let's keep going. Really responsible. Okay, that's cool. United Nations Press Pass. 
That's his MACV uh, identification card. There's a, front there's a picture of him that appeared in the New York Times Magazine of on covering a battle in 1967. He had the ear of all the journalists. That's uh, for, uh, Fitzpatrick, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Fire in the Lake. He had access to all these documents that he later showed me, took them out of his drawer when I was writing the book. Field Force magazines. Today, these are nothing, but back then, these were something. Intelligence, combined intelligence reports, order of battle. He had it all. Ge General Giap said, I'll stop for a second, please. General Giap right here said, thanks to Tham Sunam, we are in, we are in the enemy's war room. And on in the book, I describe how he learned how to write an invisible ink, and he would wrap them up in rice, and he would walk with his dog to a market, he would meet his courier, the courier would get the reports, the reports would be taken to Kuchi, from Kuchi they would be taken out uh, eventually to Kazvin, and eventually all the way to Hanoi, and after the war, on received like uh, four exploit medals for direct contributions to victories beginning with Apoc in 1963, but all the way through 1975. And since writing the book, I've learned that An actually received up to eight uh, specific commendations for his contributions to victory against the Americans. And here he is with Yap receiving his, uh, his promotion from colonel to general. Let's, uh, now, so let's stop for the Michael story for a second and go to the next slide about Michael. So Michael had asked me to take him back. And we get to case, we met in Hanoi, uh, uh, we got to Hanoi, he was overwhelmed by the fact that when you land in the airport in Hanoi and you take the 30 mile ride in, he's looking to the left and the right and he sees Mercedes, he sees uh, uh, signs, IBM, uh, uh, Hilton, all the things that show the, the effects of the new commercialization and the bilateral relations between not only the United States and Vietnam, but the fact that Vietnam, still a communist country, is progressing extraordinarily uh, with great rapidity with respect to economic development, bilateral trade, and all the things that they would benefit while still um, being a one-party state that doesn't allow any press freedom or anything like that. It's really pretty extraordinary as one thinks about it. But we are working so closely today with Vietnam on so, so many important bilateral and strategic issues. Vietnam is a strategic partner of the United States today with respect to fighting international terrorism, flyover rights. You can't be in Vietnam and not meet people from the government who are there working with the Vietnamese on some really central issues to use security, particularly flyover rights, inter international terrorism, and certainly the trafficking of women and other and, and drugs. These are really major issues that we are working very closely on, and of course bilateral trade, just last month, the, pre the pre president of Vietnam came to the United States. Our presidents have gone there. President Obama is going to go there shortly. So these are really, there, there's a great deal of, of public activity going on. But until a veteran goes back, they don't really catch it until you're right there and you see how different things look. So we're going here. And then finally, Michael wants to go to Hill 861. That's where it happened. Um, and. Uh, he hadn't talked a lot about what had happened, but he will, and I'll tell you what happened in a minute. Uh, but Michael wants to go there, but he's having a hard time finding it. He's having a hard time finding it because everything is green. And we're not alone, by the way. We, we, we go with um, uh, an interpreter. Uh, we've got two sort of officials with us. We've also got a, a, mine, a mine person with us because we're about to take a trail that you'll see because we're going to go right to the top. Um, and uh, Michael, and, and we are going to come we're going to find whatever Michael's looking for. That's all I could say at the, uh, at the time. None of us had any inclination about what that was going to be. So let's just go one at a time now. So part of the problem was that, let's go to the next slide. Part of the problem was is that how, that's how it looked when you guys were there and when Michael was there. And now it was green and lush and he couldn't find his bearings, right? I mean, the stuff worked. And so finally, and this is the picture taken, here we are with a our interpreter, our minesweeper, and the guy in the uniform there is a Vietnamese colonel who on the same, we think, on the same day that Michael was, was in battle, uh, 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 this, this guy also at the time was in the, same, was in the same battle. And I should say, I brought it with me, you know, Michael carried with me and he gave me a copy. Many of you might have one, but uh, I, have the, I have a copy here of Michael's um, uh, uh, recommendation for the Vietnam Cross for gallantry and what happened. I also have the United States Marine Corps documentation. 
of, of his unit uh, 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 commendations and for uh, what happened and for maintaining the highest uh, uh, traditions of the United States Marine Corps and the decorations for his achievements in support of the armed forces of Vietnam and their struggle against communist insurgents. So Michael carried this with him at the time. It meant, it meant, to a lot, it meant, it meant, it meant to a lot to him. And as we were going up there, he hated those communists. He hated what they had done to him. Okay? He said he has 100% disability today. He's got shrapnel on his, bo his body, and he's also got stab wounds uh, on his chest. Okay? This is, and this is a guy um, who, inside of him, though, had things that I was about to learn about, and I want to share with you, and he's allowed me to do it as well. Finally, he sees where we're going. And we, finally, we realized where we're going, and I said, whoa, wait a second. I mean, because you'll see, let's go to the next uh, slide here. We start going through this stuff, and then we start going through there. This is where I got my first leech of my life um, in, the next, in the next one. And then we met, stop the frame here too. So then we met the Montagnards, uh, and those again, again, those of you who were there know nothing's changed up there at the Montagnards, nothing at all. It was the same women smoking her corn cob pipe and the same number of kids, etc. And they flocked to Michael. You know, here he was, like uh, Moses, leading them to the promised land. You know, and we, uh, uh, and they, these kids, I have so many other pictures to show you, they fell in love with Michael and he fell in love with them. And it was really a nice warm up, but we're, but we're on a mission. And the mission is to get to the hill. We're, so let's go to the next slide. And uh, finally, uh, Let's go to the next one. I think this is, okay, let's go back for a second. Well, actually, let me read you this one, and then we'll go back. Uh, let's go back right now. So, I don't know why I bother to write notes. Um, anyway, uh, we get there, and we can't go any farther. The bomb guy says, uh, we have to stop. This is a crater, but we can't go any farther. And, uh, Michael didn't have to go any farther. What we do is we all sit down, and, uh, and this journey has taken us about five hours, six hours. I mean, it, I'm doing it in 30 seconds of, in 30 minutes of New York speak very quickly, and I hope I'm being clear. Uh, we get there, and I don't speak any Vietnamese. The Vietnamese didn't speak any English, uh, but we had the translator. And uh, Michael begins to tell the story to the Vietnamese colonel. And it's just interesting, everyone sits down, but the Vietnamese colonel and Michael are face to face. And Michael talks to the guy, and Michael has something to say that he had never told anyone his entire life. Anybody. It's the first time I had heard it. And I was merely just an observer between two warriors who, who, who only they could really feel what was going on. Michael told about what happened, told the colonel about what happened that, night, that, that day on the hill before he was evacuated out to the where he woke up on, uh, on the ship Hope. And uh, uh, he talked about being in fierce one-on-one -on -one combat, killing many VC, but also taking some serious wounds himself, barely able to stand. When he passed a young Viet Cong soldier who was, had his stomach blown out, but it was alive. And the guy looked up at him. And Michael looked, up, looked down at him, and Michael did to him not out of anger or hostility, but Michael said, out of compassion, the same thing that he would have wanted this person to do for him. And Michael put him out of his misery. And Michael, on this hill, started crying and hugged the Vietnamese commander, uh, Colonel, and said, I did that as a young man, and, and he asked to be forgiven for doing that. Why Michael asked that? Only is between Michael and his Lord and Michael and himself, but Michael asked to be forgiven for doing that. And there was a translation as a period of time. Everyone's very tense. And uh, uh, no one knew what the response would be. And this Vietnamese colonel embraced Michael and said something to the effect that, why as young men do we fight and kill each other? And as old men do we embrace and do we understand the futility of it all? You know? And the two men held each other for about a minute or two or three. And then both started sobbing, but especially Michael. And finally, Michael composed himself. Um, and he said, you know, I'm finally at peace. I'm finally at peace. And he wrote the following letter, which is the next slide. Went back down to the basic Quezon. And he wrote, to all who remember, 
I thank you for giving me the courage to come back to Quezon. You left me with the, uh, with the tools to be a great survivor. I have all of you, your spirit, I, I thank all of you. Your spirits will always be with me. God bless. And he writes his serial number, Michael Holmes, and his affili affiliation. We left Quezon. Let's go to the next slide for a second. There they are together. Let's yeah, hold that for a second, if you don't mind. We left Quezon and we went down and we broke bread with all these guys. We sat down, we eat, we had a few beers. It was just, Michael didn't because Michael's an alcoholic. One of the other things that Vietnam left him, he took him about, it took him about 11 years to, to uh, get that under control. And when he did, he hasn't had a drink since then. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, we, we broke bread, we had a few beers with them, we talked. And Michael said something at, at dinner that I, I've heard a lot at lunch, that I've heard a lot of Vietnam veterans say, as I've met them in Vietnam and elsewhere and through venues like this, which is that they felt better and stronger for having done this. And he said, told me he couldn't wait to go back again. He hasn't gone back again, but he no longer considered the Vietnamese his en enemy, but they were really never his enemy. He just carried this inside of him. Now, I'm no psychologist, but it was in there and he had to get it out or he would have lived the rest of his life. Uh, of being unable uh, to do so. But the journey wasn't over yet. So we left Quezon and we went down to Saigon. And I was writing my book about, uh, about I had written my book about Pham Soon An, and I took him to go see An. Now isn't it interesting that here is Pham Soon An, the top leading spy of the war, a general, and now I'm bringing Pham Soon An, uh, now I'm bringing my best buddy uh, Michael Holmes to see him. Why did I do that? Well, the rest of the part of the story is, in 1975, after the war ended and Vietnam was unified, the new communist regime looked around and they said, who is this guy Pham Soon An? He may be a general, but he lived with the Americans, he loves the Americans, he thinks the Americans trained him. All Pham Soon An wanted to do after the war was open up a free press in Vietnam. He wasn't a member of the Communist Party. He loved Americans, he had nothing against them. He just believed that Americans should go home. It was the future of Vietnamese to decide. When they sent him to the United States, he didn't have anything to do with the, the Americans. He loved them. So in 1975, the Vietnamese communists put him under house arrest. Well, first, they sent him to Hanoi for re-education for one year. Didn't tell anyone. Put him in a prison camp. Told him that he was too American. He liked the Americans too much. He admired Americans too much. He admired their system too much. They had to get him out of thinking like an American and more thinking like a Soviet. You know, that's where their Bible came from, right? So they sent him up, and as Ahn said, it was too late. They sent him back to, to, to Saigon, and they put him under house arrest for nine years. No contact with any visitors. Everyone tried to meet him because everyone now knew his cover. It had been blown. All the Americans, the CIA, William Colby, the American CIA director, who was his best friend in Saigon, wanted to come back and see him. No one was allowed to see him. Once the new relationship, reconciliation, Des Moines between our two countries occurred, Lan was allowed to see visitors and the like, and they all people flocked to him. And amongst all the Vietnamese, An would now lead the fight for reconciliation because he was the only voice in Vietnam who truly knew Americans, and he loved Americans, he loved America, and he wanted all of his children to be educated in America because he believed that America was the greatest country in the world, and the war had taught him that. Even though he was a spy, he never joined the Communist Party. He was spying for his country, and when his mission was over, he thought, very unusual kind of spy, you know, basically, you know, okay, we would, just, we would make amends and we would all be friends. But that wasn't the case because of the Vietnamese government. So now Michael goes to Siam. And Michael has a lot of questions for An. Tell me about Khe San. Tell me about the communist strategy. Tell me about this. Tell me about this. What happened to the cemeteries? What this? And An spoke to him for six hours. And An provided him with so much information. And Michael kept saying, I can't believe you with the enemy. And An kept saying back to Michael, I wasn't. I was never your enemy. I was never your enemy. He goes, our governments sent us in these missions, but I was never your enemy. And uh, by the end, Michael believed that. And I'm not asking you to buy into any of this. I'm just telling you this story. OK, now, next slide, because I'm wrapped up. So to show you this point about reconciliation, the very first U.S. ship ever let back in to Saigon Harbor was the USS Vandegrift, okay? And the USS Vandegrift sailed into Saigon Harbor in 2007, 
and the woman in the middle is, uh, is the U.S. Consul General. There's the commander of the ship. And right next to her is Pham Sunan and his son. Pham Sunan, the leading spy of the war, general, promoted to the rank of general by the communists, is on the very first U.S. vessel to come into Saigon Harbor. Why? Because the U.S. government was acknowledging An's role in the reconciliation between our two countries and that two former enemies could become friends. And on the ship in that, that day, and in my book I write about this, a young Vietnamese uh, uh, a lieutenant came over to An, because you can see An's not wearing a uniform. He never put that uniform on again, ever. Okay? Came over to him. And by the way, this young man on the right, his son, Pham Sun, was known as Little An. Very interesting. Uh, he has been in the White House twice already. He was the official interpreter for the Vietnamese with President Bush. And last week, during the meeting with President Obama, when the president of Vietnam came, An Pham was also the interpreter. So the firstborn son of Vietnam's top spy has been in the White House more than me, okay, <laughs> interpreting for presidents. Because An's dream of reconciliation was seen not only through his young son, but through the life of, of Michael uh, uh, as well. So An was on the ship in civilian attire. He's surrounded by all these Americans, and uh, uh, this Vietnamese lieutenant says to him, excuse me, are you Pham Sun An? And An says, yeah. And the, the Vietnamese lieutenant said, well, which side were you a general for? And An said, both sides. Um, and he laughed, and the Vietnamese guy didn't laugh, and An said, ah, just kidding. And th then he told me, and this is in the book, it says, uh, he says, you see, they, don't, they still don't know who I really am. Um, uh, and uh, it was just great. An was never allowed to leave Vietnam because they really didn't know who he was. His family was allowed to leave, but he would never be permitted to leave, not even to go to his son's graduation when he graduated from Duke University Law School and the University of North Carolina uh, as an undergraduate. All that education was paid for by private donations raised by An's American friends, almost $100,000 to, to spend so that this young man could have the same educational opportunities as as, as An. And An said on board the ship, I can die happy now. I think there's only one more slide. But we can go to the next one. It's just, uh... So when An died in, uh, the, uh, just a few years ago, with our deepest gratitude for your counsel and encouragement from the Fulbright Economics te Program team, the next one, to Pham Suan, uh, Pham Suan, all these loving memories of people he had, he had helped. These were all from Americans who had sent flowers to his grave. Now, I want to stop this for a second. In the Vietnamese tradition, there is this mourning period, and the most sacred items of a man's life or a woman's life are put on the altar as one begins the journey to the next life. And there you can see in the mid, there's a picture of Anna in his uniform, his medals, but there's his little cup from, from, uh, from uh, Orange Coast College. And we can go on to the next slide. There's, I go out, I'm paying my respects in his grave. I'm also going to leave a copy of the book there and actually burn it for him in, as Vietnamese, in, in Vietnamese tradition. He's buried there around the symbols of his life, dogs for loyalty, birds because they can fly anywhere, and uh, fish because they don't speak. Um, and there's young An Pham with President Bush in the White House, so you never know how life's circles will take you. And, uh, and I want to just close by saying something uh, here, which is uh, Michael found what he was looking for in Vietnam. I've had the opportunity to take another veteran um, uh, back as well. And uh, uh, for me, it was probably the most uh, personal and uh, most meaningful experience on all my trips to Vietnam, mostly because I had the satisfaction of knowing and I could have screwed it up. There was a lot of things bad could have happened, but it didn't. So it's great to say that I, you know, Michael gave so much for this country, and I'm just glad I was able to help him a little bit. Just a little bit. And uh, forever will be bonded by that experience. It means everything to me. And I just want to close by also saying, I know there are veterans, all you are veterans. I just want to say thank you. And um, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I mean, there's nothing else to say. I mean, and uh, uh, what you did in that war, in, in that war, uh, uh, is being acknowledged today in a way that was never acknowledged when you first came home. And the more books that are written and the more that Vietnam opens and the more recognition for eternity your contributions will be known. And I just want to acknowledge that today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you.
incredible story. Uh, we'd like to present you just as a token of our appreciation in Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association Challenge Coin. And if you go back to the history of Challenge Coins, even in the Roman Legion, they were used so that honored guests could move safely and be treated as a VIP through the legions. Know that you're always welcome here and an honored guest. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody have questions? Yeah. Are there any questions? I'd be happy to answer. If not, you know, we can all get back to work. Yeah? Did you ever read the betrayal by Colonel Corson? No, sir. No. No. But I will now. When I get back, I'll order it. He asked me if I had ever read the betrayal by Lieutenant Corson. The answer is no. It was the first book really critical when we talked about it in 1968. Yeah, one of my mentors was uh, Colonel Harry Summers, who wrote the book on strategy, and, uh, uh, but I have not read the Corson book. I regularly teach at the U.S. Uh, uh, War College in Washington, D.C., and uh, there they, re they, do read the they do read that book there. Uh, but, uh, okay, any other? Oh, yes, sir. In your many trips back there, how have you been received by the general population? Okay, the question is on my many trips, you know, it's funny, I brought a whole, I was running out of time, so I, I didn't use it, but I, I, I did have some things to say about Vietnam today. So I just had my 51st trip to Vietnam. I go about five, six times a year. <coughs> right now we're actively recruiting students from Vietnam uh, to the Honors College. Uh, uh, and these are really exceptionally gifted students who wouldn't want to come uh, to the United States and study if you're Vietnamese, okay? And uh, who wouldn't want to come? And uh, the answer is, the question is, have I ever been treated badly or how am I to be treated? I've never been treated in any way except with great respect and kindness and generosity. No one's ever treated me poorly at all. And I've noticed that veterans in particular, when you go back and you identify yourself as a veteran and if you wear your, your, uh, your identifying markings, you're, 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 you're greeted and treated even better, uh, even better than others because there's such a great respect for, for American warriors returning to Vietnam. Now, there is a difference between North and South. And there is a difference when you go to the, what I call the propaganda places, which are like the Vietnam Memorial uh, in, in Vietnam, uh, uh, which talks, the American, it used to be called the American War Crimes Museum, but it's now been changed. When you go to places like that, you do feel uncomfortable, okay? But when you're out with the people, especially Vietnam is such a young country. Do you know that over 63% of the Vietnamese population today were born after the war? It's an extraordinarily young country. English is spoken by 97% of these young people. French is no longer a language used to take your exams from high school to college. If you can speak English in Vietnam, uh, English is a commodity. You'll get a job and make more money than your parents ever made in a lifetime in the joint venture hotels, the restaurant business, the tour businesses, or, or, or elsewhere. The, 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 most, the, the interesting thing in Vietnam sometimes, because I've traveled quite a bit, if you've ever been to, uh, in Italy, especially in Rome and elsewhere, when the gypsies come over, you know, they, the little kids pull at you and they want your money and you've really got to be always on guard. I mean, it's really quite extraordinary at times. Well, in Vietnam, the first time that happened, I jumped and I had the Italian reaction, which is, oh my God, but actually they were, they were just asking to walk with me to practice their English. And that has happened more and more to me when you leave Saigon or you leave Hanoi and you go out to, to, other, to, to outlying areas and you're out in the big cities, young kids want to walk with you and talk. They want to know where you're from. Uh, you're from the United States. They all want to know, you know where. And also, so many Vietnamese Americans are going back now, again, in 19... 88, 89, 90, when Vietnamese Americans went back, they'd, have, they'd be held up, at, you know, literally by, uh, by uh, uh, the customs guards. You have to put 20 bucks in your, in your passport to let you in and all that. But now, without Vietnamese remissions back, uh, Vietnam Amer the Vietnamese Americans in this country are basically sustaining the economy in Vietnam. So the amount of money going from the United States to Vietnam to sustain Vietnamese families is extraordinary. So the Vietnamese no longer you know, do visas. Uh, we, I'm still required to take a, a visa um, and, and the like. So the more and more Vietnamese Americans that go back, the more Vietnamese that study in this country, and the more American tourists that go, 
And I'm struck in Vietnam by the number of uh, tourists from Tokyo, f uh, from Japan, because first of all, it's cheaper for, for the Japanese to go. Obviously, it's shorter to go, but it's so much cheaper than spent in the United States. Um, and uh, uh, to go, and of course the number of Australians, but the number of Americans. I was a professor at the University of California before I came to uh, uh, to Georgia State, and we have uh, education. The University of California has an education uh, study abroad center um, in in Hanoi, as does uh, as does Harvard and other schools as well. It's a beautiful place, great welcoming people, um, and uh, the food's the best of anywhere I've ever traveled in Asia. And, and it's still so cheap. I mean, and you know, if you don't mind spending 50 cents for fun in the morning, for you know, that's great. Um, and, uh, and 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 the like. So it's a, it's a it's a great it's it's a beautiful country in that regard. And a great interest, by the way, a great interest in America. Great interest in America. My own feeling personally is that the more Americans that the more Vietnamese that come and study in the United States, spend six years here and go back, it's the only way the system will change because you can't live here for six years and go back to Vietnam and have your internet monitor or not be allowed to go on Facebook or YouTube or to undergo some of the lack of basic freedoms that are denied to Vietnamese citizens. There's a reason that, you, that Vietnam is still on the Human Rights Watch and is on the list of the United States uh, government and the State Department and the world uh, for oppression of individual liberties. But it's very interesting because they want all the benefits of economic trade and bilateral relations, while at the same time the right to control their own people in a way that we as Americans, I think, find to be quite, abhor quite abhorrent. So the more I think we engage, the more we uh, educate them, the system will change. But it, like everything in life, as the Vietnamese says, it takes time. It, take, it takes time. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and one of the great ironies of the war, of course, in 1979, what happened? Going back to those dominoes, I forgot to say, Vietnam went to war with China, right, and, and, and beat China. Why? Because China just also didn't read Vietnamese history as well either. If you look at the whole history of Vietnam for 2,000 years, they only wanted one thing, which is the right to determine their own future free of foreign, foreign uh, dominance. China learned that in 79, we learned that in 75, and, uh, uh, and the Japanese learned it in 1945. Um, and so, uh, and of course, it, it, goes, it goes much much farther back in history uh, there. Yes, sir? Do you think we'll ever have politicians in Washington that know history and avoid what's going on? I know McCarthy probably no. can, but is, as young people come up, that are taking your classes at, uh, at Georgia State uh, and become politicians, you think there's any hope for the future? Well, I think it's, it's a great question about the future. I think there's great hope for the future. Uh, I think a lot of the smart students who will hope for the future decide not to enter politics. That's the whole thing. Um, and so I don't know about politics. I'm most worried, actually, not about, about politicians. I'm most, I'm most worried about the American public, which is grossly grossly ignorant on a lot of really important issues. So I think that the more educated we become as a people, the better politicians we might elect. But I, I think if we depend upon ourselves to find bright politicians with, without really engaging ourselves in the issues, that, that's, that's, that's tough. Yes, sir? Uh, have you read the Better War, Lou Sorley's? Lou Sorley, yeah. I, the question is, have I read Sorley's A Better War? I've read Sorley's A Better War. I've read his book on Abrams. And I just finished reading his new book called of the man who lost Vietnam, which is about Westmoreland. He's a dear friend of mine. He's endorsed two of my books and a good buddy. Yeah. Well, one of the points that he makes in the war is that there's basically a disconnect between the ordinary Vietnamese and the government, at least there was in the South, and that, that the, the northern government was all wrapped around Ho Chi Minh's devotion to the communism rather than any devotion that Ho Chi Minh had to Vietnam. And that I think that wraps around some of the things that you've said, that uh, the people out on the street, they don't care about the government. So this is a really important point. This is a great question, which is really great question. It comes to the heart. Something that you don't ordinarily, we don't ordinarily talk about. How is it that the North Vietnamese can endure I mean, I could, if you have a chance, you're in Hanoi, go to the Ho Chi Minh Museum, trail, the Ho Chi Minh Trail Museum, which is about 30, 40 kilometers out of Hanoi. 
How is it that Vietnamese husbands and wives could say to goodbye to each other because they were going on a trail and not see each other for six or seven or eight or nine years? And how can we explain the devotion, the human sacrifice, and the extraordinary casualties and everything that the North Vietnamese endured in this war against superior technology and everything? It's because they had something they believed in what they were fighting for. They were fighting for their country. One Vietnam, not an artificially divided country. They believed, whether it's right or wrong, they believed in the cause that they were fighting for. But in the South, this is the sorely point, in the South, the United States helped create an artificial government, a government that, and a people, that the people were real, they wanted the benefits of freedom, but a government that only existed on American aid, on American advisors, on American support. And those of you who worked with the Arvin know what I'm talking about, okay? And while you could find isolated Arvin units that were, and leaders, we never did anything as a country. And Westmoreland certainly didn't do it. Abrams tried to do it. We never did anything to cultivate a leadership in Vietnam, political leadership that could the, the people in the South could rally behind the same way the people in the North rallied a, around Ho Chi Minh. We never did that. And Ho died in 1969, so we never created in the South a leader or a cadre of leaders. And you don't have to go very far to find Vietnamese today who will say that that is the reason the war turned out the way it did. I think that's a little simplistic of a point to say that's how the war turned out, but the fact is is that we never did it. And so in the South, we never created an equivalent in the North. And uh, yes? I believe you mentioned the mines on the trail. Yeah. Have they been able to clean up the battlefields to any extent, or is that a big problem? It's a big problem. I was just there uh, about six months ago for something else. You can't go to certain areas. And I'm working on this new project now on Agent Orange. and. Uh, uh, it's very interesting, you know, if you want to study Agent Orange, what's the best place to go? Well, sure, you can go to the VA, and I can talk to all you guys, and I am, and I'm interviewing a lot of people, but why not Vietnam, right? Well, there are still areas in Vietnam, you know, these hot spots around Da Nang and elsewhere where it was stored, where you can't get within uh, five miles of it because it's, it's still so dangerous, so contaminated, so hot, and these are known as the hot spots, and, uh, uh, and this is where the stuff was stored. So, um, uh, but uh, on the mines, Every six months, you read the newspaper about a mine going off. Some young kid will have his limbs blown blown off, you know, and, and the like. It's usually it's only a Vietnamese. There might be some uh, people who work for the organization right now. That um, you know, I think the issue of repatriation of remains is one of the most interesting of the war. This is how we learn about mines, also, because we need the Vietnamese government and we need their help to help us identify MIAs who went down, and we're working very closely. With, with, with the Vietnamese right now in this project. But after the war, one of the conditions that the Vietnamese government requested and was denied by Kissinger and Nixon, rightfully so, was the issue of war reparations. The Vietnamese wanted reparations for war. And we said, no, no way, we're not paying reparations for this war. You know, we're gonna get rid of, we're gonna get out. We're not sending our armies back. You know, we're not gonna interfere with the political process. We want our POWs back. We want an accounting for our MIAs, but we are not sending you money. That's how it lasted until 1989. But with the repatriation uh, now in the movement, the way the Vietnamese are doing it is they are getting, quote, for each body that we, try, we bring back, remains that we bring back, and each one we go after, the price per person is extraordinarily high, which in lingo is a, a form of, repeat, uh, of payment that was denied to the Vietnamese in the beginning. The reason I say this is that uh, a lot of these are in areas where the mines are. It's very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. You can't go in there without lots of experts. And uh, so the answer is no. Even in, I was in Apak, which is the Battle of 1963. I don't know if any, well, it was a Vietnamese battle, but in Apak in 63, there were certain areas where you couldn't walk. And certainly when you, when you get up to Khe Sanh, it's certainly, it's certainly the case. Areas around Pleiku, same thing. So that whole area. I want to thank you all, and uh, I hope if you're in downtown Atlanta, come visit us. <laughs>